You probably know that the shape of the honeycombs is perfectly optimized so that the bees can take up as much space as possible to reproduce. But did you know that humans are also working on creating such structures at the nanometric scale? And not only that, but materials with that structure have super interesting properties. They could be used as sensors, as targeted drug deliverers, light sources, among many others. And I'm sure you've already heard me talk about this kind of effect in some shorts I've uploaded talking about titanium. However, in today's video, I'm going to talk to you about this type of material, ordered nanoporous ones from aluminum and silicon, thanks to the collaboration of the cost net pore action funded by the European Union. So I present to you the ordered nanoporous materials. And let's start at the beginning. What is nanoporous? What do these porous materials have to have to be considered as such? Basically, they must have parallel hollow cylinders that run from the base of the material to the surface. And to be considered nanoporous, the diameter of these cylinders must be between 10 and 400 nanometers. And now let's go to the second part of the name. We have said that they are nanoporous and ordered. Order in this context is understood as the arrangement of those pores on the surface of the material. Earlier we talked about honeycombs because in honeycombs, obviously, all these holes are perfectly ordered throughout the entire structure. Well, the same thing happens in ordered nanoporous materials. These pores are perfectly ordered in a region of space and in the messy ones, no, they would be placed rather randomly. Now, as you can imagine, when you're working on such small scales, when you try to do this on a slightly larger scale, let's say millimeters, that you can even see with the naked eye, it is very difficult for everything to be perfectly ordered in that region because we are talking about literally millions of pores and you cannot go one by one placing it as you want. So within this context of ordered nanopores, there are what we call domains, which are zones where these pores are perfectly ordered and other zones where they are also ordered but shifted in orientation with respect to the other domains. But as a whole, they are still ordered. Well, now that we know what these ordered nanoporous materials are, let's see what they are for. Well, as we said at the beginning, the usefulness of these materials is extremely wide. The simple fact of having these nanopores means that the materials to which they are applied, in this case, silicon and aluminum, make these materials acquired different electronic properties so that they can be used in electronic systems. It can also be used in capacitors. They can even be used in vehicles, architectural materials. They can also be used in nanosensors, which are basically nanometer scale systems that allow you to measure variables and convert them into a measurable signal. And what's really fascinating about this topic is that for a particular element like silicon or aluminum, all of these possible applications depend solely on the characteristics of the pores, such as their size, their depth, and so on. So simply by varying the shape of those pores, we will be able to use the same substance for different applications. This is one of the most fascinating parts of nanotechnology, how with very simple modifications to make in a material, you can change the properties in such a way that it can be used in totally opposite things. And in addition, as recycled raw material can be used to make these materials even biodegradable, this makes this technology a very viable alternative to achieve this type of application in a much more sustainable way. Now, as we have said, this video is made in collaboration with the COST action, which focuses on these materials made from silicon and aluminum. One of the main reasons is that silicon and aluminum are among the two most ubiquitous metals on the planet, which makes it a sustainable source of raw material over time and at a reduced price. Apart from the fact that they are biodegradable and once the treatment is done, they are not toxic, let us see then what properties each one has. Once the silicon has been treated to form these nanopores, it can give properties such as luminescence, that is, produce light based on an electric current, biodegradation. It has the ability to host other elements in those pores and therefore give it a different functionality even sensors. It is not toxic, it has an affordable price, and it is already one of the most ubiquitous materials in electronics, so it would not be very difficult to implement its new applications in existing devices. On the other hand, once aluminum forms these nanopores, first unlike silicon, a layer of aluminum oxide is formed, which is what gives the structure to those pores. So as main characteristics we have that this material, once it has formed the pores, is cheap. It is a fairly inert material because that aluminum oxide reacts with few compounds, at least under normal conditions of use. This also makes it have a low toxicity, since although aluminum and its ions can be relatively toxic because of having an aluminum oxide layer that protects the interior, it can be used safely. But well, after all this, I suppose you have the doubt of, well, how do you do this? I just said it's simple to make, but is making those neat nanopores in a material really complicated? Well, let's go to the laboratory so that you can see how extremely simple it is to get this in a material. We are going to see it in aluminum. 
Really, to do this experiment, we are only going to need an aluminum plate that, as you can see, has a special polish. A solution at a low temperature, as you can see, the glass is foggy because of this coldness. And an electricity generator to control the voltage and intensity that we will apply. On the other hand, we need a cathode. In this case, it is an inert platinum cathode, and when we introduce it into the solution with the potential already applied, we can see how the process begins. It's as simple as this, and if we look closely, we can see how the aluminum plate changes color. That's how simple it is to anodize aluminum. And what we're looking at now is the montage that's used to make different samples in parallel. This would be an example for a single sample. And there are also systems to make four or eight samples simultaneously. As you can see, it simply consists of immersing an aluminum surface in the anode of a solution with an electrolyte, connecting it to an electric current, generally using an inert cathode. In this case, it was platinum. And let the current circulate at the right intensity, power, and time. In addition, it is also advisable to keep the system cold, as the temperature can accelerate the process too much and end up having unwanted results. So look at how absurdly simple it is to get this type of structure in a material with a cheap starting material. And an extremely simple technique we can convert aluminum or silicon in any of these applications that we have said before. And this is nanotechnology. It may seem that nanotechnology is something ultra futuristic with super crazy machines, but in many contexts nanotechnology is something extremely simple, but it changes the properties of a material so much in this case at the surface level that it turns it into something with totally different properties and with totally different applications. And using these techniques is how electronic devices are increasingly improved, made cheaper, more affordable, or even more versatile. But well, going back to the topic of how these materials are obtained, the technique you have seen is called anodizing. We are going to explore how it is possible that passing an electric current from an anode to a cathode leads to the formation of those ordered pores in the anode. The science behind this process is different for each element. Since we are discussing two elements here, we will see how it happens for aluminum and for silicon. In the case of aluminum, the first thing that happens is that the outer layer forms a completely smooth, flat oxide layer without any pores. However, this aluminum oxide takes up more space than the metallic aluminum beneath it. This creates tension, causing the aluminum oxide to crack and peel away, so to speak. As a result, the electric current concentrates in those cracks, and oxidation begins more quickly in those areas than elsewhere. This allows the solution's electrolyte to penetrate, which is how those pores start to form on the surface. Now, the entire theory behind the growth of these pores, how we go from those initial tiny pits to a larger structure with different characteristics and properties, is a vast field of research. If you're interested, I encourage you to explore it further on your own. But basically, it is known that to modify both the distance between the pores and their depth, as well as the pore radius, it is simply a matter of adjusting parameters such as time, temperature, amperage, power, or the electrolyte in the solution. By manipulating all these factors, it is possible to regulate and control the shape and arrangement of the pores in the final aluminum oxide. Even so, what we have just described produces disordered pores. There is no specific order in what we have seen. The pores are literally formed where the fissures occur in the aluminum oxide. However, scientists Masuda and Fukuda developed a two-stage method that managed to turn this type of structure into something perfectly ordered. The technique and idea are truly impressive. They developed what is known as soft anodizing, which basically involves performing the procedure we described earlier, but then applying a treatment to remove the aluminum oxide, leaving only the gaps previously created in the metal by the oxide formation. After that, the anodizing process is repeated on that surface, resulting in much more ordered structures than before. However, I must emphasize that the domains we mentioned earlier still exist. Now, since these types of materials have so many different applications and possibilities, there are various methods to generate them. Some are more viable at the micro scale, while others can be scaled more easily for industrial production. Having already discussed aluminum, let's move on to silicon. The main difference between the pores that form in silicon and those that form in aluminum is that, in this case, no oxide is formed. 
The pores are etched directly into the silicon itself, which is a fundamental difference compared to aluminum, where a new chemical compound is created. Another key difference is that, while with aluminum we can use different electrolytes, in the case of silicon, the most commonly used electrolyte is hydrofluoric acid. Naturally, the conditions for performing this procedure are much more aggressive and cannot be done in a simple beaker outside of a fume hood with an ice bath, as we did in the experiment shown earlier. And in the case of silicon, although it is true that there is still no clear and precise consensus on the mechanism by which these pores are formed, the parameters that affect all the dimensional characteristics of these pores are well understood, just as they are for aluminum oxide. So, as you can see, there are still avenues for theoretical research in these fields. Basically, the main factors affecting the characteristics of silicon pores are the concentration of hydrofluoric acid, electrical potential, current density, illumination intensity, and surface energy. As you can see, even light can be used in the process of pore formation in silicon. As I mentioned, it is a much more complex field than that of aluminum. To wrap up all the properties offered by porous materials, we should also discuss what can be done once the pores have been created. While these materials already possess properties simply by having pores, there is more you can do with them. One of the main things that is done is to introduce functionality into the pores. Molecules, elements or metals can be introduced to form nanorods. This essentially involves filling those pores with a metal and then removing it to obtain perfectly ordered rods at the nanometric scale of the metal that was introduced. Alternatively, the metal can be left inside the pores. This opens the door to many possibilities, as materials with magnetic properties can be introduced into these pores, allowing for the creation of nanometric scale memory disks. Additionally, by controlling which pores the materials are inserted into or how the elements are introduced within the same pore, it could even be possible to generate nanoscopic barcodes. In this case, where we are modifying already formed pores, the size and characteristics of the pore will obviously determine what we can do with it. Clearly, if the pores are narrower or wider, different molecules or substances will fit, and we will be able to perform different treatments accordingly. Furthermore, by adjusting the pore sizes, we can detect certain molecules or others. A substance that reacts through a redox mechanism with a specific substance that fits into those pores could be introduced. During this redox reaction, a charge movement occurs, which can be detected by a sensor. There are also optical detection methods, where light is shown on these pores, and depending on whether the substance to be detected is inside the pore or not, the light reflects in one color or another. As you can see, this is one of those fascinating fields of science where a process as simple as passing electricity through a metallic substance in a solution produces such complex changes and opens so many possibilities that it turns something simple into an entire world. A vast field of research. In fact, to show you how complex this can get, I asked a member of the research group to share what challenges researchers are facing in this area, particularly what they find most difficult to achieve. This is what he answered. The challenge is, above all, to make these ideas useful. And that is why NetPOR is working to bring them to people in the form of rapid and inexpensive antibody tests that allow the detection of pollutants in water, improve the energy generation efficiency of solar panels, or enhance the energy storage capacity of batteries. Scalability at the industrial level is another challenge although I am sure this can be overcome if a direct utility to the public is demonstrated, as the market would then drive the technology. As you can see, for me, the most important part is almost the first line. The challenge is, above all, to make these ideas truly useful. This is, in fact, the goal of practically all nanotechnology, to ensure that through these processes something is created that can be useful to society. And at the moment when those materials or techniques become useful to society, as he himself mentions at the end, investment is made in these materials to increase their scalability so that they can be mass produced and the research ends up reaching people. This is how all the technology and nanotechnology we know today has developed. The moment a nanotechnological advance has proven its usefulness to society is when investors have stepped in. That is when the possibility of bringing it to the world arises. But what's truly fascinating is that all of this begins with something as seemingly simple as creating nanopores on the surface of a material. Now that we understand how it starts and what the current state of this research is, I also asked this member of the research group what he believes the future of these materials holds. His response was a bit longer, and I'll share an excerpt of of what he told me. 
Research results always have an uncertain future. Only a few results reach the public. For me, the example of the COVID vaccine is very significant. Research into mRNA on the one hand and lipid nanovesicles on the other would not have had much of a future if it were not for the pandemic, but at the time it appears, it just so happens that a researcher from Hungary working in the United States is uniting these two concepts and may propose the mechanism of the vaccine. In other words, everything depends on the opportunity, but that opportunity only exists if someone does research in a very broad sense and in many things. Once again, for me, the most striking part is the first line where it says, the results of research always have an uncertain future. And that's how research works in science and engineering. It's clear that when a procedure or a new material is discovered at some point in history, it will find its use and its niche. However, you never know when that moment will come. Maybe it will be 200 years from now, or maybe it will be next week. As he mentions, it's a matter of opportunity. At some point, a problem will arise and that material will be there to solve it. A very important point he makes at the end is that this opportunity only exists if someone is conducting research in a very broad sense and across many areas. On the one hand, this suggests that it's important to investigate practically everything, to have information about every physical, chemical, and biological phenomenon happening around us, because at some point that information might prove useful. On the other hand, it also highlights the importance of multidisciplinarity, as communication between different fields of research is what will allow these materials and techniques to have potential applications in the future. In my view, this is another fundamental pillar of nanotechnology. This science is highly multidisciplinary. Physicists, chemists, and biologists all participate in these departments. There are nanofabrics made with cells, chemical reactions involved in these processes, such as anodization, and physical processes as well. All of this must be understood from various perspectives, and one must be able to seek applications in different contexts where communication with other sectors is essential. So as you can see in this video, we have discussed ordered nanoporous materials made from silicon and aluminum, but this simple topic has led us to talk about nanotechnology as a whole, and I hope this video has shown you the beauty in going from a seemingly simple process like pore formation to everything behind the science that studies and analyzes how these processes occur, with the aim of applying them in the future. With that, I hope you enjoyed this video, and a big thank you to the people at NetPore for making it possible. See you next time.